I'm Dr. Ernest Jackson, and I'm honored to share with you the living Word of God. On the last week, we were continuing to talk about if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. We talked about on last week the importance of what God has given to us for you and I to realize we have a responsibility for it. We have a responsibility. We're supposed to maintain what he gave us. But we didn't know. We thought that God's going to give this to us if we just walk in it, enjoy it, and have a good time in it, and didn't realize there was a responsibility. So you and I must maintain this life he's given us. But this week we're going to go a step further than that and show you. I was going to go talking about, I was going to start talking about uh, peace rest, things of this nature, you know, joy, because I want us to see how we can acquire these things, but there's something more important, something more pertinent. And the problem is this, the problem is this, we are not aware that in access, the access we have, we're not aware that in the midst of that, there's a responsibility to maintain something else. And it's the most important thing of them all. What would that be? The integrity of God's Word. We live in a society that believes we can have our own beliefs, and we do, and we can. But now, what is real? What is reality? And in psychology, they got this thing, you know, <laughs> they got, you know, different types of reality and they'll tell you, you know, in, in the psychology, although this may not be real to you, it's real to him. But through my experiences with this God and real life, there are things that are absolutely unequivocally true, undoubtedly true. There's reality that faces every one of us that has been established by our God that no one can get around. Do we know what it is? Uh, no, I don't think we do on the basis of whole because it's what we're supposed to be standing on and we don't know it. The greatest reality of them all, it's God's Word and God's truth. And we, as believers, churchgoers, however we call ourselves, must obtain and maintain the integrity of this word and of the truth. But we can't do it if we don't know it. In John 17, 17 through 19, Jesus says, you know what? Sanctify them by thy truth, thy word is truth. Then he goes down and says, I sanctify myself by thy truth, that they may be sanctified by that truth. Same truth, paraphrasing. Then we go, yeah, we're sanctified by the truth. But what is truth? What does that word truth mean? Do we even know? And we don't. So how can you stand on the truth if you don't know what it is? What is the reality of these things that we call ourselves believing them? See, because we have believed them so long, that's all they have become to us is a belief. Now watch what I'm going to say. This is this not being critical of anybody else's denominational beliefs, what the case may be. Watch what I'm going to say. If you believe in what you believe, and I believe what I believe, and he believes what he believes, and she believes what she believes, and they believe what they choose to believe, it's all beliefs. But is there a reality or just our belief? So if that's the case, then that would say that... We all believe in a God, a different God, but none of them are real except they're real to us. And if they're not real except them being real to us, then wouldn't that make them a figment of our imagination or a figment of somebody's imagination? And they believed it so much that they told us the same thing that they believed and act like there was another person that told them this stuff and it's not real. And so we believe what they believe, and uh, they believe what they were told to believe, and what we have is not certain, no more certain than what they have, if the God of heaven and earth that we believe 
and come into faith or persuasion to follow him. If this is not real, then like the writer said, we're the most miserable men. Live today for tomorrow we die and if there is no God. But this is not true. We don't realize that the words that are used in the scripture will point out reality and we don't know that the words that they state, the definitions, mean reality. We don't know. So we go believe, and I, I don't know about you, but I, I gave up on believing God a long time ago. Let me sound strange. I gave up on believing God a long time ago. Let me see. Um, back when I was 17, somewhere along in there, I began to be some, receive some tangible realities that I didn't hope for, that I didn't expect to happen. So, in that, I knew there is somebody on the other end of this belief. <laughs> and he's real because he did stuff that I didn't expect him to do. Am I boasting? No. Am I proud? I'm very proud. But am I proud that I'm heady or high-minded? I'm proud that he proved to me back then that there is reality. And he tells us to seek it, but we don't do that either. Think about this. Now, you would know that God... His name, even if you go to the Tetragrammaton, which, you know, people are going like, you know, what's God's real name? It was just letters that he gave Moses. And Israel and, and uh, the Latin folks put letters in it, you know, E-O, so they could pronounce it. Some switched it from Y, put a J in there, but in certain languages there's no J, so all that kind of stuff. But, you know, YH, you know, YH, uh, what his name was, as it was, you know, originally given. But imagine how high that name is, so, so high that you couldn't pronounce it. No one can really enunciate his name as to who he is. We try. That's why they put, you know, uh, vowels in it to try to pronounce it. But imagine how high the name of God might be. No man could arrive unto it. No man could come to the height of it. Because it is his, his pure name as God. But what if there was something higher than that? And we didn't know it. There is. Y'all should have known that was coming. <laughs> and it's in the scriptures. Don't believe me? Go to Psalms. It's uh, 138, Psalms 138, Psalms 138, and 1 and 2, Psalms 138, 1 and 2, and it reads to us. It says, the Psalms of David, so we know David said this, I will praise thee with my whole heart, before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple, this is what David says, and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. We should be shouting over the truth alone. He said, I'll praise you for your loving kindness and your truth. Watch this. For thou hast magnified. God, you took this word. The things you spoke and you broadened them, you magnified them. How? You magnified thy word above all thy name. Look at this. So God, whoever he is in his magnificence, which we can't comprehend anyway, his broadness, his depth. Remember now, the scripture says, from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. That's how long he's been around. Knowing him, he probably stretches to both ends of it anyway. But he magnified his word above his name. Above, oh, look at it. And he just said name above all thy name. So God is known by more than one name because he's God. But whatever his names are, his name is in its broadness, in its greatness, and in its magnitude, in its magnificence. He magnified the word above all his name. Why am I going this way? So that you and I might come to a conclusion, 
to accept the word of God as it is and stop trying to just believe it. The word of God is so strong and so powerful that except he gives us life and the ability to walk in it and live in it, we can't come near to it if he doesn't. I was driving along the other day and I was thinking about he said that the name of Jesus, but I said the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. And for go to work, why got to be the name of the And then the scripture says there's no other name of the head whereby men can be saved. And we go like, wonder why that? Well, he who was with God and was God paid the price for all of this, suffered, bled, and died, and rose again. He is the only way out. That's why. So, we do a huckle book because we don't want to accept this. We want to believe this. We don't want to yield to it. But here's the awkward part about it. There's no other name under the heaven given because he is the only one that paid the price. He's the only one that went through death, went into hell, and got up so, like the scrubbing bubble said, he went to hell so you don't have to. If we live in him and walk in the same truth. This is unique to me. How is it that this God who was who was uh, brought down levels descended down in character and ability to become a man, to suffer, bleed, and die, raised from the dead, you know, and all that good stuff that he did for us, and then empower us to do the same? What a wonderful God. What are we thinking? But then we do a huckleback. So I'm not ready. I don't know. I don't feel. You know, I ain't through partying yet. All that kind of. Stuff. And there is no other way out but him. And why am I going this way? Because I want us to begin to look at the integrity of God's word and how we should maintain it. Now you go, well, how you do that? Well, the world is not going to receive Christ by word of mouth, just you saying so, because. In 2022, folks are looking at your life all the time. Isn't it the strange thing? They're looking at our lives and we're not. They're looking at our lives when we claim to represent Christ and we're not looking at our lives claiming to represent Christ. We're really not looking. We're just being who we are. And we think that that's okay, but it's not. What about the integrity of the Word, all the things that the Word says that he died for, and all the things that Paul wrote that were behind the scenes supposedly done in us, if any man be in Christ is a new creature, the most uh, prominent of them all, that we are no longer bound by sin, but we show the world that we are. So if the world looks at us and see that we are still bound by sin, then the enemy does a PR campaign, you know, public relation campaign against the kingdom of God. Saying, you know what, that salvation stuff that them folks get to preach in the car, carrying on and shout and run around right in because folks are still in sin. And the bad part, the bad part, the worst part of them all, there are people in churches that believe you can sin and it's okay. Yeah, a lot of people that are believers believe that because folks that are carnal have taught them that, you know, it's okay, God understands that. But no, He understands that you disobeyed Him. He understands that you or I have yielded our flesh again to sin after He had Paul to write that yield not your members unto sin, to be servants to them or to it. And we do it anyway. Paul told us that, you know, if I'm sinning and I'm not supposed to sin, then there's no longer I to do, but a sin done got in, and he's overthrown me, and he's overtaken me. It has overtaken me, so that it's controlling me and made me its servant again, or its slave. If we don't break the cycle and step up into God's word, like a news word, his word ain't breaking down at all. At all. I sat back one day, and I kind of considered the fact that... Uh, uh, Israel, when God gave them things that they had to do to seek forgiveness. And everybody out there basically were cutting up, so they had to find lambs and ducks and birds and stuff. Imagine millions of people running around trying to find all this stuff because they keep cutting up. Thank God that he ain't making us do the, uh, you know, the sacrificial part of the, of the law today 
Boy, you think folks are cutting up and robbing each other and carrying on? Man, the farmers would be in serious trouble. They think the wolves be eating their lambs and stuff. It'd be the church folks out to get them something to sacrifice to God because we cut up so bad. But the integrity of God's word, many times, the reason you or I may live below the integrity, two reasons. We don't know what it is, where it is. And we're not delivered to walk in it. So the world is watching us no matter what you say. I, I, I've talked with people that call themselves, you know, they, you know, Jesus is my Savior. And I'm like, really? Yeah. And they, they just, oh, hallelujah. They pray, Jesus is my Savior. I love the Lord. And somebody said the wrong thing and they cuss them out. And then folks go, they make, <laughs> they make excuses. Well, no, but that's just nothing, nothing but words. He's having a hard day. Huh? I've been having hard days a long time. I've been having days a long time, hard days a long time. I'm not tired yet. You ain't got to give up. You can do this. You can live for him. But like I said on last week, the most important thing is location, location, location. You have to put yourself in the position that the word says we should be in. When we don't, we suffer loss. And the enemy is waiting to take an advantage. I want to back up just a little bit on last week going back to James uh, first chapter James the 27th verse I'm going to back up a little bit um, and then we want to give you definitions a couple of definitions James 1 and 27 it says pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this to visit the fatherless and the widows in their afflictions when Fatherless and widows are going through changes, visit them. And to keep himself or herself unspotted from the world. Because God wants to touch lives and comfort lives and give them solace and peace and strength and encouragement through you and I, but it's not going to work if we're not clean. It's not. We like to believe, well, you know, it's a good gesture, the Lord knows my heart. His spirit is not going to work through an unclean vessel. He don't do that. He doesn't do that. Especially if you know you're supposed to be clean and you're not. If I know I'm supposed to be clean and I'm doing something different, then I'm thinking, well, you know, the Lord knows I represent him. I'm, I'm a preacher man and all that kind of stuff, so God's going to do it. Uh -uh. He killed up, folks. Read it. I don't think you or I are greater preacher men than Moses was. And he knew God face to face and God killed him anyway. What are you and I thinking? <laughs> if we're going to try that, hopefully it'll work. Wait, then we go like, well, we know what I like about God. <laughs> He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, that, well, that, well, <laughs> well, then if he killed Moses, he'll kill you. He'll kill me. This is no game. This is not a game. And we're not thinking. Well, the Lord knows my heart. Yeah. Yeah, just like he knew the heart of the two guys that uh, rebelled against Moses. Moses said, well, everybody come down here. We're having a meeting at, over at the tabernacle. And them guys go, I ain't coming. So Moses goes up there and God gets mad. And the earth opens up and swallowed everything that pertaineth unto them guys. The wife and kids didn't do nothing. But they ticked this God off. So he swallowed them. Their wives, their kids, their cattle, their tents, and everything that pertained to them. And the scripture says it went down to the pit and the earth closed up without a trace. This is the same yesterday, today, and forever, God, that we're supposed to be serving. And we're not walking in the integrity of his word because we don't know how to. Um, why not? It's, it's not available. Surely it is. But we're so busy doing other stuff. And when calamity hit, believe me, the scripture says, when I call them and you would not hear, when calamity comes, I will laugh at you. It's bad enough when you hurt yourself. And somebody will laugh, that ain't funny, that hurt. But when calamity comes and God laughs, uh, that's a bad place to be in for anybody. Is that what we're looking for? Is that what we expected? But that's what we'll get. Let's, let's look at another scripture. I'll give a different one for this week. I want to look at another one. Ephesians 5 and 10. And it says, Ephesians 5 and 10, I'm already ready. I don't want to 
get too far ahead of you. Ephesians 5 and 10. And it says, prove that which is acceptable unto the Lord. You and I should prove, our walk should prove, our walk should be in integrity so that the world will see by our actions that we can prove what is acceptable in the Lord. One scripture said, you know, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Same thing here. We should be able to prove it thereby holding up the integrity of God's word. Watch this. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Well, you know, we, we, we got to reach them somehow. Well, you ain't got to be in the alley drinking with them. You ain't got to be at home watching, you know, Naked pictures and stuff with them. You ain't got to be, you know, hanging out with them in the atmosphere that they're in. The scripture tells us, come out from among them and I receive you, saith the Lord. But we figure we know better than God does, so we do what we want to do and figure it's going to be acceptable. It's never going to be. Don't fool yourself. It's never going to be. I don't care how you slice it and dice it and convince ourselves that it's okay. The word of God says no. And here's where we break down the integrity. Because we change the truth of God into a lie by doing what we want to do. And not knowing there's a price to pay for that. You may not know, but it is. One of these days I'll give you a scripture because it talks about he that addeth unto these things. He that taketh away. You can put yourself in a bad position. Well, watch this. I want to show you this. Um, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Things that people are doing for you to be involved with them. It's a shame to be even spoken of. And you're hanging out with folks like that? Like that. You know, we came up together. I'm okay. I got folks I came up together. I have brothers that got, you know, weren't saved when I got saved. I stopped hanging out with them. We living in the same house. <laughs> they did. I stopped hanging out. I'm the first one got saved. I stopped hanging out with them rascals living in the same house. I had to do something different. This was calling me at 15 years old. 16 years old, I separated myself from my own brothers in the same house. They started getting saved afterwards, but I cut myself loose from them. Why? Because it was necessary to follow this Christ. And little did I know then, by following him the way I had to, it maintained the integrity of this word because the world is looking at us. I got people that I've worked with for years, lived near for years, and they look at me and say, yeah, he's the same old guy. He's been like that for 20 years. I ain't playing. Look, and, I, and why am I doing it? There was a time I was doing it because I didn't want to go to hell. But skip that. <laughs> skip. Going to hell, pfft, I ain't worried about that. Why? Because I walk in obedience. Now why do I do this? I'm not doing it just because I want to go to hell. I'm doing it because I love him. I'm doing it because I honor him. I'm doing it because what he's done for me. This is the least I can do. Now if he said to me, well you got to do exactly what I did, everything, then we got a problem, Jesus, because uh, uh, that's a lot of stuff. <laughs> he went through a lot of stuff for us and we won't even just live this with the imbuement or his empowering us to do it. Not only that, I saw something in scripture that is regularly in the scripture, but I thought it a bit crazy. What I mean by that is this, with all due respect to the master. Imagine this, not only he gives us this life, he puts his life in us, but then uh, another one of the Godhead, the Holy Ghost, is in the earth and comes to live in us as well who will guide us into truth. He will lead us into truth. He's right here. And we shout with him. We use him to shout and get our praise on. But we ain't using him to live nothing. Uh, we better do that with the Holy Ghost. But that's not what he's here for. <clears throat> to guide us into all truth. And we're not letting him do it. But all things that are reproved 
are made manifest by light. So whatsoever doth not doth make it thus manifest is light. That one go down to the thirteenth. I want to reiterate the fact that we still supposed to be walking in light. He enables us, like I said, imbued. He enables us. He empowered us to walk in the light. Now, as we grow and develop, we'll walk in greater lights. But you and I should walk in the fullness of the light where we are. Well, I just got saved today. Walk in what you got today. That simple. Walk in the fullness of what is in you. That simple. With a pure heart. And God will enlarge you. And your capacity will go from a, <laughs> how can I say this, a thimble to a soda cap cup. You know, top of a soda cap. Next thing you know, you got a, you, you got a half a cup of God's nature. You got a whole cup. Next thing you know, you'd be several gallons and you'd be ready to roll. But whatever dimension is in you, brother, sister, walk in the fullness. Because wait, when we was out there partying, we were not the greatest parties out there. Some of us fell out drunk, got high before we could do any partying, really. But we fell out with the best of them. Somebody said, well, man, you shouldn't have fell out because we still had this fifth. You shouldn't have fell out. Man, man, the dude, he came up with some terrible weed after you left. Oh, you shouldn't have passed out, man. Uh, but that was your capacity, wasn't it? <laughs> you, you, said, you said, I drunk them fools under the table. And you find out you the only one under the table. Not them. You drunk your couple of cups and down you went. <laughs> but you was out there. Right? So what are our excuses again for not living in God? I, it's hard for me to comprehend now that he's done all this and we won't take advantage of it. Now I understand why the scripture said, how shall we escape? Think about that. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? How? We're not going to get away with it. Because the same God that we're refusing is the one we're going to end up facing. How about that? I'm like, oh no, we've got some problems. But I'm going to take you through some Psalms and show you something. We have to walk in the integrity of God's Word, the truth of it. Let me do this. The word integrity means, in case you have a pencil and paper, which you should, integrity means the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles or strong moral uprightness. So, the point would be, you and I should walk in the integrity or the quality of God's word being true and honest and the, the uh, standards of strong moral principles. God's word has integrity and you and I should walk in that. If God's word says it can be done, it can. Did you get that? If his word says it should be done, it can be done, and we should be doing it. So, one scripture says this, examine yourself, will he be of the faith? And again, faith does, and that does not mean believing. I keep telling folks, look in the Greek where the word faith is, belief is in there as a definition, but I think about the third or fourth one from the last. The first one, you know, <laughs> it's not saying that you know, it's telling us if you're going to walk in this, you got to walk in persuasion. Meaning that belief is in the core. You believe it enough, you believe this is real, let it take its place in your life and then you walk in it. You follow this, you act on it. That's what faith is. Stepping forward. Look up the scripture, you'll find out what Abram did or Abraham did. God told him to do something. He stepped out and did what God told him to do and it was counted for righteousness. So by the way, righteousness means equity. So does integrity. It means equity or an even balancedness of doing things that are right. So you and I should be balanced. Wait a minute. If he cleanses from all unrighteousness and put righteousness in us, why aren't we walking in it? It emanates its own life. The Spirit of God or the nature of Christ emanates its own life aside from us. 
He came unto his own, his own received him not, but the, the light that was in him was the life of men. Go back and read in St. John, the first chapter. Well, the light that was in him was the life of men. So now we got this light. It should be our lives as well. Only we don't know it, and no, we don't walk in it. My thing, what we want going this way, because I want us to begin to stop just believing and go after this thing. Look, you, you ever have a uh, uh, orange, and you're trying to, you know, make you some fresh orange juice, and it may not be that juicy of orange, and you keep twirling that bad boy, hoping you don't get some more juice out of it, or you're drinking juice out of the, the bottle that's just left, and you said, this got to be more than here than that. And you're trying to get every last drop. Are you doing that with the Word? Are we seeing this life of ours that needy because it is? Oh, we don't know it. Watch this. Psalms 43, Psalms 43 and 3. Psalms 43 and 3. And it says, O send out thy light and thy truth. Look what he's saying. God, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Give me, give me a, 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 an illumination. But give me your truth as well. Bring the look. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacle. This tells me truth with what is right and the light of God will lead you in the way you should go if you or I are committed. It has a life of its own because he says, send it out and let it lead me to you. Let it lead me. Look, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Your light will lead me. Your truth will lead me. Watch. So we got that one. Let's, let's go to the next and make sure I get my right, my right position here. Trying to get my letters. Okay, let's go to Psalms 51. So let's ask ourselves a question. Out of all the things that God would want in a man. We would say, you know what? God wants us to be clean. He wants us to be holy. He wants us to be righteous. But there's one thing in particular that God wants in the core of us. If we allow it to be, He wants it in the core of us that will bring about all these other things. Psalms 51 and 6. And it says, you know, remember we said a scripture the other week, what does the Lord require of thee? Well, this one's going to tell you what he wants. 51 and 6. Psalm 51 and 6. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me know wisdom. God wants his truth in the inward part. That means you and I have to come to a place to know truth and to yield to the truth then it will bring forth, it will blossom forth. Remember the scripture talks about, oh, in Ephesians, the fruit of the Spirit are these, which will manifest are these. The truth will bring forth these fruits in us. But we don't have enough truth in us. We don't go to the truth, and we don't realize the truth in itself, what it stands for. We're going to show you in a minute. Let's go to another one. Um... Let's go to Psalms 96. This is this is a good one, but not a good one. Psalms 96 and 13. Psalms 96 and 13. Psalms 96 and 13. It says, Before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and his people with truth. So truth is something that is apart from who we are that God's going to judge us by. But wait a minute. We often quote the scripture, you know, you know, the, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Yeah, 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 we got the scripture. But what does it matter 
if you or I don't embrace that and let the truth be in us. Because he's going to judge us by truth. We have access to truth. The Spirit of God is going to guide us into truth. And then we're questioning everything that God's Word says against our church doctrine. Let me do this. One of the things that's really, really, really bad in these times, in these seasons, is what people are believing. i got a strong one for you. This ain't going to go with too good. What you believe and what I believe doesn't matter at all. It doesn't. Except what you believe and I believe is the truth of God. God's not going to move on what you believe or what you perceive as the truth. This is why some of the, you know, Paul said, you know, don't deal with these folks in their philosophies and stuff because it'll cloud your mind from the reality of God. Somebody says, well, that's a different reality and this is a different reality. Yeah, 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 let's say there's 20,000 different realities. The one that you need to be concerned about is the one that God is concerned about. How about that? If you want to peek at those, but you need to get this one right because everything is based on this in the presence of God. So, a lot of this stuff that we're guessing on and wondering on, we shouldn't be. Because I'm finding there's a wholesomeness of God's truth and of God's word that we're not looking at and we have to be established in Him in an effective way. Let's look at John. John 30, I want to go John 8 and 31. A familiar, a supposedly familiar scripture. And while you're getting those, I'm getting prepared for a couple other definitions for you. John 8 and 31. And it says this. Then said Jesus unto the Jews, those Jews, excuse me, which believe on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now some have quoted and say the scripture shall set you free, and then we go, the scripture shall make you free. And that means the truth's going to come in and get you out of jail. If you're in bondage, the truth going to... Wait, 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 wait. Not so fast. Not so fast. First of all, he was talking to the Jews, and it tells you, he says, if you continue. Look, and it says, the Jews which believed on him, these guys believed already. He wasn't talking to the unsaved. He was talking to those that believed on him. He said, if you, what? Oh, you Jewish guy that just, you believed on me? If you continue in this. Uh Uh-oh. How about that one? We were looking at, yeah, but, and the truth shall make you free. No, he was telling those, even those that believe on him, because that's who he's talking to, Jews that believe on him. If you continue in the truth, if you continue my word, the truth will make you free. But here's the thing we didn't look at. You shall know the truth. Let's go back to the know part. And you shall know, which is talking about in um, a great variety of applications, as this and with many applications, uh, at left others. It says allow, be aware of. So. You have to allow this word to guide you. Allow this truth to be a part of you. That's how you have to know it. Not by here, but inside. And as we know this truth, we let it, we apply it, we allow it to work in us. And it's going to set us free from some other things. Watch this. And the truth shall make you free. Ye shall know. So my point is this. Many of us have been in churches, and I'm not fighting anybody, but what we believed is not whole truth because most folks don't teach whole truth, and I'm not fighting anybody. It's just not what's done on the basis of a whole. Okay, So, uh, it's important for you and I to examine what we're being taught against the Word. Always, you know, no disrespect to anyone that calls themselves an apostle, prophet, bandit, pastor, teacher, bishop, deacon, elder, 
whatever the case folks call each other, call themselves, it's, it's totally irrelevant to me. I'm not fighting you. My point is, those that would follow those that are in these offices or positions, brethren, go behind them, ask them for scripture, go behind them and search the scripture and know truth. Why am I saying that? Because there's only one thing up in the scripture that is higher than God's name, all names of God, and that's his word. And Jesus said, listen, Father, in the 17th chapter of John, he said, I sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. So if thy word is truth, the truth is your word. And that excels God's, all of God's name. So uh, you should aspire to that. We should reach for that. So much what you know, you gotta you gotta realize you, you never go hide in your past. So, oh please stop that. Don't look, look. Jesus said the works that I do shall you do also, and greater works than these shall you do. And if your pastor's not doing them, Jesus said you can do it, then automatically you excel where your pastor is. And you're not doing it to be heady or high minded or to take over. Because folks are strange. If you know a little bit more than them or search further than them, I've been there, did that for years. People don't know your heart. You, if you're trying to do it to get above your pastor to take his place, then you should get jacked. <laughs> and jabbed and punched. No more. <laughs> this should be, you can sit your hips down. But anyway, <laughs> that's not what you're supposed to be doing. I'm trying to, to motivate you to go after truth, not doctrine. Go after what the Word of God says and not just what is colloquially or generally believed. Because what is generally believed in most ministries, in most doctrines, in most teachings is not wholesome. Because they haven't taken the time to do it. They really haven't. And uh, who is feeding who? What's on John? And you shall know the truth, 30, 32nd verse, and the truth shall make you free. It's going to set you free. And the truth is prevalent. I like the truth because it always unfolds itself. And there's certain things that you can't search out now because God's not going to reveal them to you. But it was prophesied that what he would do, certain things he had in reservation, reserved to re be revealed by the church to the body. And so we have to come up to the knowledge of God's truth that is given to us so we can prepare for the hidden things. Where we stand now, where we walk right now, some of the hidden things ain't never going to be revealed to us. Why? We don't have a heart. Blessed is the day that hunger and thirst after the right, for they shall be filled. And since we should know the truth, and the truth is going to set you free, Jesus said, search the scriptures. We're not doing that. First of all, examine to see what you're being taught is what the Bible says. The way you're being taught is what the Bible says. You've heard me say this for a long time, if you've been watching the program for any length of time, that we have a habit of cherry picking scripture. We'll pick one out here, one out there, and we can you know, try to make a wholesomeness. But here's something I found out. There's one thing about truth. There's one thing about God's word. It's uniform. It's uniform. And what that means is this. If you get a truth here and get a truth there and get one here and get one there, when you bring them together, if it's of God, everything will fit. Truth does not conflict with truth. But we can believe a doctrine here, believe a doctrine there, believe a doctrine here, and believe one over there. When we pull them together, they're going to clash. Watch this. Let me show you something else in here. Let's see if I can pull this over. Yeah, 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 yeah. Watch. Let's go back to the 32nd verse. And ye shall know the truth, right? Okay, the word truth here means true, right? And it also means verity. Watch. And ye shall know the truth, this is from the Greek, and ye shall know what is true. And true and truth, the definition of truth is this. That which is true or in accordance with oneness or wholesomeness or what accordance means, 
with fact and reality. See, God, God does not design this thing so you just believe, believe, and never know truth. Never know the reality of it. God didn't design it that way. If that was the case, then science would supersede God. Because I like the scientists because if they tell you something's going to work, more than likely it's going to work. It may not work on every occasion. But see, they do trial and error and when things, you know, they have a, 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 a step of doing things, you know. It may be a theorem, then it becomes a theory, and then it becomes practical. They'll try it out until it becomes a consistent reality. Did you get that? They, this is why we got Aspen and different things. They try, you know, <laughs> they do those trials on them and whatnot, and they go, you know, well, uh, out of 100,000 people, it worked on 90,000, so we can assure ourselves that this is going to work. But then the body metabolism is different. A whole lot of stuff can get in there. But they have proven this to work, right? Would you believe that the scientists are better than our God? Of course not. They, they can't be. But you can't prove it to them if you and I don't reach forth and touch him and this God of the reality of realities step forward and prove himself. Hope that wasn't too strong. Somebody said, well, 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 well how are you going to do that the same way they did it in the book? They did it in the book. Same yesterday, day forever. Remember that one? <laughs> so if this is true, and believe me it is, he will show himself strong. Okay, let's do this. I'll get you this other definition where it says verity. All right, over where truth is, it had true and then it had verity. And the word verity means a true principle or belief, especially of the fund of fundamental importance. It is a truth that has to be in the core. It is a truth or belief that has to be in the core of what you're standing on. So there's a reality of God that supersedes everything else. A reality of his word that is so powerful that it rises above his very name itself. His word uh, transcends his own name. So it's provable. We even showed you scripture. It's provable. But we drag our feet. And I, I'm going to say this. I don't know if you know this or not, but we believers, we confessors, we declarers, <laughs> we followers of Christ, whatever we call ourselves, we need to do a better job than we're doing. We really do. We re representing Christ the way we do and acting the way we act and, you know, living the way we live. And those that are out there that may really want Christ, we are stopping them from coming into the kingdom because we're not standing on the integrity of this word. Folks are taking a heartbeat. Yeah, I know a reverend. I saw him down at the juke joint. You know that they new dance they got? I saw him, I saw Reb down there. And then they basically assume that it's all the preachers are that way. Brother, sister, that's you. Sit your hips down. For the Lord has to do it. Because we're taking away from the integrity of his word by being carnal. By being fleshly. Somebody said, well, who are you fussing at? I ain't fussing at nobody, but I'm just doing like Paul did when Peter couldn't make up his mind where to stand. He said, wait, you, you, you don't want it, Paul. You can't switch lanes. Be this when, the, when I'm not here. And then when I come back, you be this. Make up your mind. Get this right. Don't you think it's time? Don't you think it's time that we stand on the integrity of God's word? Watch this. Let's go over here. And let's see. Let's go to Proverbs. And so Solomon's writing in Proverbs. Proverbs 22 and 20, what's what he says? Proverbs 22 and 20, he said, Have not I written to thee excellent things? Things that rise above the norm? He said, Have not I written to thee excellent things? 
in councils and knowledge that I might make thee to know the certainty of the words of truth. Look at this. I don't want you believing, he says. Have an, uh, look at the stuff I wrote, the man of God says. I gave you positivity. I wrote things that you could double check and that were absolute. And I did it. Look, you, you know the stuff, the excellent stuff I wrote to you in counsels and in knowledge? I did it that, that I might make thee know the certainty that it is absolute. And by the way, by the way, the word certainty has a definition that righteousness has and that, you know, uh, 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 integrity has. And what it is, what it is, is equity. Same definition. So, he said, I wrote those things to make you certain. Look at this. So you know the certainty, the absoluteness of the words of life. He said, I want you to know that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that sinned unto thee. The servant of God, it says, should be, he be perfect. For the word of God is given unto him uh, that he might be furnished. That he might be furnished, that he can give people the word of God, that the man of God may be perfect to teach. Why? Because when people come to you, you have to know this stuff is true. Not believe it is not good enough. It has to be true. Now watch my point. Paul went forward, and as he went forward through the different kingdoms, of grip or whatever have you, he got to one, and after he talks to the guy, he goes, you know, I almost I persuaded me to become a Christian because Paul reasoned with him. Reason in righteousness and of judgment and of things to come. There are times we need to reason with men and women of truth. By the way, stop condemning folks. You know, he's a this and she's a that. So, you're supposed to be a man of God. You're supposed to be a woman of God. Oh, is your life clean? If you Look, if your life ain't clean, don't try to help folks of another denomination, of another faith, because you ain't even in the one you're supposed to be in yourself. I had a guy come to the door one day. And uh, he wanted to talk to me, you know, he passed me a pamphlet, wanted to talk to me. And he asked me the strangest question. And when he did, I answered the question. And then I answered, if, when he was asking another question, I answered that too. And uh, by the time I got through, he's like, who are you? And uh, you know, I said, well, I'm not even done. So and so and so and so and so. Uh, you got any writings or anything? And this, this guy came to my door. So he asked me and I told him, you know, what the program was on TV. He wrote it down and said, I'm going to watch. He said, this sounds interesting. Because I begin to witness to him, telling him about Christ, getting away from the issue of, do you expect to live this life forever? I go, no, because of New Jerusalem <laughs> is coming down from God and this and that. And he's like, whoa. I'm not there to embarrass. I'm not there to confront. But I'm there to give truth. And if our lives are clean, should we be able to shine the light to everyone? Everyone that come and ask for this, shouldn't we be able to give them an answer? Don't you think? I do. And so that's my aim. I got a couple more I want to get with you. Get to you about real quick. If I can get these over here. Let's see. Let me get down here. Okay, yeah, let me do this one. Oh, no, I don't have time for that. Let me do this. Do this one. Christians ain't wanting to come up. Oh boy. Okay, just messed up my scriptures. Okay, I can remember part of them. Over in Mark 7 and 13. Mark 7 and 13, which hit something in my scripture just disappeared on me. So work with me. Mark 7 and 13, I believe. I want to get down here real quick. And when Jesus was talking, and he says in the 13th verse, I clicked something wrong over here. Making the word of God of none effect. I want to bring out the point that even in our traditional beliefs in our churches, if it's not 
what we believe is not exactly what the word teaches it kills the word in us sorry but that's just reality it will kill the word in us because it's not saying what we're teaching what we're believing is not what the word of God says so you and I must be very careful except from what we're passing on passing on to our people we're passing on error because that's what we believe and it's not good enough Paul began to tell him one place look I got news for you though we or an angel from heaven preach unto you any other gospel that which ye have received let him be a curse are we checking preachers what we've been taught to preach by other preachers are we checking to see if that's in the Word of God I had a friend say to me one day said yeah he said a lot of stuff that people are saying ain't even in the book I'm like yeah I know and these are folks that are not really walking with God walking with God they're noticing stuff that we're saying we don't give scripture we have the floor we have the platform we have the ears of the people but what we're saying is not scriptural because many folks are listening to hear scriptures I, I for one am I remember years ago when I got a, a Dake's annotated reference Bible when they first came out I got one back in the 60's late 60's coming out of Georgia and a lot of and they got a lot of scriptures Dake's Bible got a lot of scriptures oh my god they got scriptures for you before you start the chapters <laughs> they got scriptures while you're going through them and at the end of the book they got all kinds of, I went through all of them bad boys wanting to know truth and some of the things that were being taught, there were scriptures in there, but the scripture didn't match the scripture that the scriptures are talking about. <laughs> they didn't match up. Why am I saying that? I wasn't looking for fault. I'm not saying to put anyone at fault. I'm just saying, search through this so you'll know. And if, I don't care what nobody told you. Somebody said, well, you know, an angel spoke to me. Well, let him be a curse. God gave this. Life's in it because of God and men that follow God. Turn to truth first. Like I said on the other week, stop looking for everything else. Find out what you need to know about living this life and search it through to all the scriptures that are in the book. Not just the book you're looking at, in the Bible. Search out all the scriptures concerning that in the Bible. That way you got something to go on. And if you do it regularly with a prayer life, God will reveal the scriptures unto you. He'll begin and reveal truth unto you. But if you're not doing it, if you're not clean, and you're not following his truth and following his word, you can't walk in integrity, and you cannot maintain the integrity if the integrity is not in you.